If you missed the announcement last week, we announced that Angie Ellis, who is the wife of Russ Ellis, an elder of the Oasis, has moved on to another job. She's been here for six years, and we honored her in a big way last week. And uh, the plaque hadn't come in, hadn't arrived. And we got her plaque today. And Angie, if we could give you this plaque. Beautiful plaque. We thank you for that. Thank you. She took another job. Over a year ago, the elders had decided that there wouldn't be a staff member related to an elder. And Angie and Russ discussed that. The decision ended up being made that she would leave this year. And, but we wanted some overlap with, with uh, my time with her to kind of learn what's going on at the Oasis when I arrived in April. And that we we're going to extend that eventually then to the end of the year. And uh, so with her, with her void being gone now and with what we're wanting to do for the future, we have three, almost three, uh, paid part-time positions that we've opened up. Uh, uh, she was administrative assistant, so we have a part-time administrative assistant. Uh, Anna Reynolds is doing that. And uh, we have, as you saw, Christine Pittman. She is the events, groups and events coordinator. And we're soon to add a third position in the process of that with Stephanie Bowe being communications director. And uh, there's a whole list of people who contribute and volunteer their time, but there are some critical positions that we felt that we needed to pay at least on a part-time situation right now uh, as we grow and as we expand. So we're thankful for uh, those guys stepping up and, uh, and uh, we'll miss Angie in the office, and, uh, but we plan uh, big time for the future. But, but thank all of you guys uh, for the critical roles that you uh, support and play here. Uh, also, I'd like to bring up Tracy Hoffman. Tracy, would you come up here right now? Tracy uh, makes this all happen in a, in a way. We meet in a school system, and the school demands, requires, that we have custodial staff here. And uh, Tracy, I want to welcome you. And uh, Tracy, I mean, you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to find custodial, qualified custodial staff who's willing to come in on a Sunday and open up for us. And Tracy has been so flexible for us. In fact, we thought we weren't even going to be able to meet here during the Christmas weekend. But Tracy's actually worked that out where she's going to drive back. And we had to go, felt like, through some hoops in order just to be able to meet here at this school. Well, we wanted to kind of honor her in a big way because we really appreciate her flexibility. Uh, sometimes we're here really long. Sometimes we're here all the time. You know? But anyway, Tracy, we want to say Merry Christmas to you give you this uh, uh, there's a gift card in there and there are people who sign that card and we want to express our appreciation for you being flexible and caring for us. So thank you. How am I going to preach in 15 minutes? <laughs> Old 
because they are so cram-packed with great doctrine and meaning. And I think by studying these over the next few weeks, these sounds of Christmas, I'm calling this series, that we might learn a little bit about what the church stands on doctrinally. It might help us put a little connection between what we hear during the Christmas season and how we behave when there's getting a little pushing going on. So anyway, I hope we can have our faith reaffirmed as we look at some of these Christmas carols that I want to study. And the first one that I want to look at is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, the lyrics, the words to Hark the Herald Angels Sing was written by Charles Wesley in 1737. Now, Wesley was one of 18 kids. Only 11 survived back in the day. But their mother, like the pledge of these parents up here this morning, was so dedicated in instilling in her children Christian values. And uh, John Wesley was the great English reformer. The Methodist Church was a result of John Wesley's influence, a great preacher. Charles Wesley was also a preacher who wrote this hymn. But he's better known for the hymn writing that he uh, had composed over the years. Some speculate that he wrote over 6,000 hymns. Like Christ the Lord is Risen Today is still another one that's sung some centuries later. But the melody, the tune to Hark the Herald Angels Sing that we use today was written by a, gay, a guy by the name of Felix Mendelssohn some 100 years, 100 years later in 1840. Felix Mendelssohn, he was, a, he was Jewish. He became a Christian. And uh, he was actually composing some music to honor the guy who Gutenberg, who Johann Gutenberg, who uh, developed the first movable type printing press. He was writing some music for that. And uh, the tune there, uh, one of the tunes that he wrote, was blended with the lyrics that we have from Charles Wesley. And we had now what we have today, this famous tune. But Wesley's words are so theologically sound. So I want to look a little deeper into this hymn and get some doctrinal truths out of that. And the first thing I want to see is the first stanza of this, of this hymn announces Jesus' birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled. And Wesley was obviously referring to the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. I want to read verses 8 through 12 for you right now. When the Bible reads this, and this is where we get the first stanza, there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. On the night Jesus was born, this angel suddenly appears this group of shepherds out warming their hands by the fire on a hillside, and he makes this announcement. And the hymn says, Hark the herald angels sing. So this first stanza affirms what Scripture teaches, that angels are real. Angels are God's messengers. They can appear and disappear instantly. They have different types of appearances. Isaiah describes an angel with six wings that flew. Hebrews talks about angels being appearing as people who can appear and disappear. But angels are created by God to do His bidding, to, to, to serve Him, to do what He needs to get done. Now, if you were a shepherd and this announcement of an angel from an angel had been announced to you, that's pretty spectacular. Now think if you're an angel, and you're coming down, and you're making this announcement, just a few shepherds out in the dark on this hillside. That's not too spectacular, is it? I mean, the most important birth of all of human history, God's Son, God in the flesh, is being announced to these shepherds. A buddy of mine who uh, was going to have a son, he wanted to announce the birth of his son in a spectacular way, and he was he decided, I'm going to get some cigars for all the guys. And he decided, well, I won't get a cigar. But he found these bubblegum cigars. And he passed those out to, to all of his friends. He wanted everybody to know. But if you were God, and you had anything at your disposal, and you're having the announcement of your one and only son, how are you going to announce that? 
I mean, it'd be in a big way. I mean, you'd want, you'd give everybody gifts. And, and then you would Facebook and Twitter and announce it to people you didn't even know. <laughs> that my son is being born. But, but God's ways are not our ways. And he announced this to these lowly shepherds. But there's more to the announcement. More to the scene, more to the event. Verse 13, it says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. It doesn't say how many angels appeared. It says a great company appeared. And how much is a great company? Well, we're not really sure. It says that Jesus had at his disposal 10,000 or a legion of angels. So there could have been multiples of 10,000s of angels that appeared in the sky at that night. And uh, I mean, that was an, a spectacular event. But there's something just kind of downer about that. I mean, there's ten, there's multiple thousands of, of angels that suddenly appear, illuminate the sky, the, the area, with just about a, a dozen handful of shepherds. I mean, can you imagine what the angels said when they went back up into heaven? They said, all that planning, all of us angels, you think we got the wrong place or something? You think God meant us to do that somewhere else? But you know what? They probably weren't saying that. They were probably saying, you know what? It's just like God to care for a lowly group of shepherds out on the hillside. When Charles Wesley wrote this hymn, the opening line doesn't even mention angels, as biblically correct as that is. The opening line that Wesley wrote was, Hark how the welcome rings. Hail, glory to the King of Kings. That word welcome is an old English word, word that means the vault of heaven. And that's how it was sung for several years in Wesley's own church until a guy named George Whitfield came along. He was a classmate of Wesley at Oxford. And they got together and he rewrote that first line. And uh, Wesley says that uh, Whitfield, not quite as educated as I am, because he said the angel, Hark how the angels, Harold Angels sing. Well, the scripture doesn't say that the angels sang. It says they spoke that announcement. They didn't even sing the amount announcement. So Wesley kind of gets him for that. But people around the world, on the note of this, these angels, these angelic beings singing, I mean, that became popular in music and in art and in literature and even in sermons some hundreds of years later that we're talking about singing angels. And they spoke the message in Scripture. But Wesley's hymn encourages us to join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. We're to, we're to join the triumph of the skies. I want to duplicate that event. I mean, Christ had an announcement of his birth. So I want to mimic that announcement this morning. So I want you all to pretend to be angels. I know that's a stretch for some of you, but I want to try to mimic that announcement. We're going to say, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. We're going to put that phrase up on the screen, and we're going to repeat that three times. I want to split right down the middle, and you guys are going to be angels, okay? You guys are going to be lowly shepherds. All right. So I want you to announce... Uh, Loudly, it says that the angels appeared. So I want to say that three times together. So are you ready? One, two, three. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. It's no wonder the shepherds were terrified at that announcement. I want to try it again. It says that the angels suddenly appeared. I wonder if they kind of faded away. So you guys, it's your turn to be angels right here. And you guys, lowly shepherds. So I want to start real loud. We're going to do that three times. We're going to do it loud, medium, and soft. Okay, so you ready? One, two, three. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth.
impacted them so much so that they looked to one another and they said this, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. It was a motivating, life-changing announcement for those shepherds, and it should be a changing event in our lives too. Secondly, the second thing teaches about Jesus' identity. Christ, by highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. One of the great things of the old hymns are, is that they teach the spiritual doctrine. These sounds of Christmas teach doctrinal truths that are everlasting. And I think one of the things that's disconcerting about the modern church is the lack of emphasis on Bible and Bible teaching and Bible doctrine. And today there's this emotional aspect to church. And people say, well, what do you think of church? Oh, I felt really good. I felt really God's presence there. That is great. That is excellent. We should feel good about that. But if your faith is only built on emotion, it's going to waver when tough times and when the political correct world faces you, we're going to waver and be on shaky ground. I mean, if your marriage is based just totally on romance, when those rocky times come, you might not be as committed. And that's the same thing with the Christian faith. It's just, just emotion to you and the rocky ground you're faced with. It might cause you to waver because you know what? There are going to be people in the church that disappoint you and you might get all bent out of shape because of the church and you might get mad at God and you leave. Or there, there are... Uh, so much in the world today that we're faced with. And you hear that and you go, and you evaluate, is, is this really true? I mean, there are things going on in our culture today that probably causes good, strong Christian people to think, is this, is this really right, the way that I've learned about Scripture? Maybe I was wrong in that. I mean, I was looking at the, at the news last week. The Supreme Court decided not to hear a lower court's decision. I think it was New York. It was up east somewhere. A lower court's decision to ban churches from meeting in schools. I mean, can you imagine the impact of that? Now there are going to be multiple churches that are going to be kicked out of the schools. If you're a teacher and want to play basketball during the week, you can come and use the school at your leisure. But if you're a church... You can't do that. And there are going to be people that are left thinking, well, maybe there is something to this church and state, this separation. Maybe that's really real. We shouldn't really go into the schools. And your faith is going to be wavered a little bit. And there's this war on Christmas. Um, there's signs that come up all the time at Christmas signs. This one talks about the myth. Uh, you know that the, the reason isn't Jesus and this, this atheist group. I heard a minister last week from Athens, Texas, talk about how he was defending this group, there's one person in the town that's mad and upset that on the courthouse lawn they have something Christian on it. And they're suing this city. And there's this war, this continued war. It's true that there's this war on Christmas. And then there's, there are tree lighting ceremonies. Well, for what holiday? Well, I don't know. Well, maybe Christmas, but we can't say it's a Christmas tree, but we're going to light those trees. I mean, isn't that just kind of ridiculous? But do you think, well, maybe we shouldn't say Christmas because it's going to offend. And then there's this guy. What is that? What is that? This, this, this guy's phenomenal. <laughs> you guys are hate up. Uh, but it, you know... What controversy? And there are Christian people to say, you know, I don't know if he should wear his Christianity on his church sleeve. I don't know if he needs a prayer game God glory. That's what we should all be doing. Wearing Jesus on our church sleeve. And we should be praying. And put, we shouldn't shy away from our faith like that. And if your faith's not well grounded, you're going to be shaken up when that world propaganda and the political correct culture in which we live comes attacking you on your own doorstep. Somebody said it's faith, fact, faith, and feeling. Facts to be believed in the Bible, faith to be acted upon, and feeling we should enjoy that. That's why the Bible says stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on to you. And that's what I like about the Christmas songs. They teach so much doctrine. In this, in this hymn, it teaches the deity of Jesus. It's when it says Christ the everlasting Lord, we've got that printed in your bulletin if you want to serve with Christ the everlasting Lord. He's everlasting. He's eternal. Jesus was before 
uh, all things and he's going to be after all things. We have a beginning. We're going to live eternally in one of two places, but we had a beginning. But Jesus is everlasting. It teaches the Jesus incarnation when it says late in time, behold him come. He was born in Bethlehem. That's his incarnation, but he existed way before that. But he left the spiritual realm and was born. That's the incarnation. It says veiled in flesh, the Godhead see hail the incarnate deity, Jesus, God in the flesh. That's why John writes in his gospel in the Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The message, Eugene Peterson, he paraphrases that the Word became flesh and blood and He moved into our neighborhood. And that's why Jesus can't be compared to Muhammad or Buddha or Moses because He's different. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the incarnation. It teaches the virgin birth when it said he's the offspring of the virgin's womb. 700 years before Christ's birth, Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Then the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, You're going to have a child. How can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel tells Mary not to be afraid. And Mary's reaction was one of astonishment. How will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The virgin birth is a basic fundamental teaching about Jesus Christ. And people say, how can that be? Well, with God, all things are possible. That's what the angel told Mary, because all things are possible. So Jesus had a divine nature. The hymn also teaches Jesus' humanity. Pleased is man with men to dwell. You can circle that too. Philippians says, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. And he actually not just left the spirit world, but he humbled himself here on earth as well, a little third, three-year-old was asked my mom, what did you learn in Sunday school today? She said, I learned that Jesus had dirty feet. She said, what? She said, Jesus had dirty feet. What do you mean? Well, Jesus washed all the disciples' feet and nobody washed Jesus' feet. Jesus had dirty feet. And he did. He didn't come to this earth to be hailed as a kingly ruler as we think of a kingly ruler. He came to earth and chose to be born to peasant parents to get his hands and feet dirty in a rough neighborhood. And that's what he chose. That was the humanity of Jesus. The poem goes, he made himself vulnerable, breakable, pierceable. He was so much man that he slept in a boat. There's so much God that the wind ceased when he spoke. He was so much man that he wept when Lazarus died, but he was so much God Lazarus came forth. He was so much man that he died on a tree. He was so much God that he rose in victory. That's the truth. The stanza, the third stanza of Wesley's hymn, emphasizes Jesus' purpose. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. What does Jesus do for us? Well, he brings light. You can circle that in your bulletin. He brings light. John 8 says that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have what? The light of life. And the world's going to tell you the opposite. Oh, you believe in that church stuff, that Bible stuff? You're going to be unenlightened. You're going to be sold out, brother. What makes a person enlightened? If you know all the... The stats of the teams in the NFL, and you don't even know the president and vice president's name, are you really enlightened? Or if you're somebody, Madonna's going to be singing at Super Bowl, if you know every one of her songs, and you don't know Charles Wesley, are you really enlightened? What makes an enlightened person? Well, an intelligent person is somebody that has knowledge about a subject. A wise person knows how to apply knowledge to everyday life. Jesus said, what is the proper man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? What's he talking about? I think in part he's talking about understand there are some important issues of life and Jesus Christ sheds light on that stuff. And that the Bible says that the Bible is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And anything that's important, God is going to shed light on that for the future. So you consider, am I here by evolutionary accident or by divine design and you think God planned us even formed us in the womb and you stand on scripture does God know and care about me personally some ask in this world today he knows the he has the hairs on our head numbered 
Is there really just one way to God? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. What's my primary purpose in life? To accumulate things, to enjoy pleasures, to gain status? Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things are going to be added unto you as well. Because he brings light. And he also brings life. He brings life in that same phrase. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But the adversary is going to say, Church is boring. You've got to commit intellectual suicide to go to that place. You're going to be unenlightened. But he brings life. I didn't know Christ until I was 20. I mean, I was deep in sin. My life was marred and scarred. And when I came to Christ, man, I had this grin plastered all over my face. And I went to this Sunday school class at the church. And there were other people my age. And they looked sleepy. And they were bored. And one of my friends later admitted, he said, you came in with a smile plastered all over your face. He said, we didn't want to think about that. But it is contagious. And you know, Christianity is not all about, but these people look so sleepy and bored. I mean, it's terrible. Kind of like some of you guys out there right now. When's it going to be? <laughs> no, you're not. That's what I like about this church. You guys are able to laugh and enjoy Jesus Christ. There is more life in this place, in this church, in this school than there is ever in any bar that you're going to find. But He brings light and He brings life. And He brings healing. Risen with healing in His wings, the hymn says. And the, you know what the world says? Don't go to them Christians. They're going to condemn you. They're going to make you feel bad. They're going to call you a sinner. But you know what? Jesus is a great physician. But He doesn't just touch up the x-rays. He diagnoses the problem. He tells you how to be healed. And you can be freed by His wounds. We are healed, the Bible says. Wesley was referring back to Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. And the passage says, You who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, morning to the, glor the morning and glor the, the glory. <laughs> what they call Jesus, the Shining morning star. <laughs> yeah. And that's what he's referring to here in Scripture. And that's what uh, Wesley's reflecting on when he's talking about that. The, the ending of that verse says, And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. So when you come to Christ, there's a healing in your life. You don't only really want to smile, but you want to leap like a calf. If you've ever seen one pent up, you know what that is. He also brings hope. The hymn says, Smile, he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, I tell you the truth, unless man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And somebody said, you know, if you're born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born twice, you're going to die once. Because when you die and you stand before God on your own and you've not accepted Christ, you're going to stand before God in your sins. And you're going to die a second death, the Bible says, because you're going to be separated from God for eternity. Remember, we're alive now and we're eternal. We're going to live forever. But if you die in your sin without being born again, without having the second birth, you're going to die twice. You're going to be separated from God for eternity. However, if you stay before God, having been born twice, having the second birth, as the hymn talks about, God doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees Jesus. And there's only one death. So if you're born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born twice, you're going to die once. I heard a preacher try to explain this this past week. Just happened to be flipping through. I guess God knew I needed an illustration for this point. And he was saying, well, what is born again? And the preacher explained that. And when he was done, I told Denise, I said, what did you say? It was so convoluted. It is so simple. If you believe in Jesus coming and dying on the cross, if you believe in that, you're immersed in water. That combination, God works a miracle in that. Somehow, I'm not sure, but Romans 6 talks about it. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism. That's that water event into death. That we might be raised from the dead to the glory of the Father. We too may live new life like Christ. But that's so simple, it requires humility, doesn't it? It says there that glory to God in the highest. We want to give God the glory. But we go, well, that's not the way it's done. That's just too simple. I want to glory to me, glory to me. I want to do it my way. And we try to work things out on our own. And we disregard the clear teaching of Scripture sometimes. But Jesus provides hope. Hope. 
and that he's the only person who has ever conquered the grave. Isn't that the truth? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So here's the hymn. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark! The herald angels sing. That word hark means listen up. There's an important announcement in every Christmas season. God in an uncanny way developed this Christmas season where we're going to hear the sounds of Christmas. Would you hearken to the message of the Savior that's been born? Hail the Prince of Peace that says that word hail means to salute or to submit to. So part of it is harking, part of it is hailing because we want to submit to the glory of the Father. So when you hear the sounds of Christmas, don't just let them go one ear and out the other off your tongue. Let them change your life and your behavior. And most of all, perhaps, is your eternity. Would you pray with me? Father, we, you have such a spectacular plan, a spectacular announcement, and you've used a simple thing such as this season we call the Christmas season. To every year, remind us of what our purpose is, what your purpose is. And we hear those sounds of Christmas all the time. I pray this year that we would hark and that we would hail and understand the importance. It's not just how I feel when I leave here today, but it's what I do. It's how I yield to you. It is so important that we put things in place when we yield to you. That we follow the tenets of Scripture, the truths of the Bible, not just some church, not just some guy preaching, but what you wanted to communicate clearly. I pray today that those who accept your truth, that they understand that they've got to do something. And you know, the first step is being born again after they believe. I pray that there's somebody here today that needs to do that. They need to understand the gravity of that and where, where they stand in eternity if they were to die today. And there's such rich fellowship of this church. There are people who are being knocked back and forth by the winds of doctrine, by the difficult circumstances that they find themselves in in this world. I pray they could stand on the truth of your word and stand in the truth of this church with a fellowship of people who love them. I pray that they could decide today to take that next step and even join the fellowship of this church as we offer that. We pray that in Jesus' name. God loves us so much that He sent His Son. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing. If you've never accepted Christ, understand you can do that here in this building, in this school, in this church today. There will be people out in the back here that they can help you take that next step. They can pray with you if you want to be as bold. But we're singing. It's a time that you think about that and to make that step day. We can do that today.